welcome to the interview. With me today is a very special guest, Leon Panetta, former CIA chief and defense secretary of the U.S. Mr. Panetta, welcome to Beyond. Nice to be with you. About 30 days to go for the election. How is it shaping up according to you? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting election. Uh, uh, Joe Biden is, uh, is running uh, ahead of uh, President Trump right now uh, by a fairly good margin, about uh, 10 points or more uh, overall. Uh, the real question is, of course, these uh, target states uh, that uh, represent uh, key votes with regards to the electoral colleges, uh, states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, uh, Florida, and others. Uh, there, the races are a little closer, but uh, this morning we just got a poll that in Pennsylvania, Joe Biden is nine points ahead. So uh, right now, it's, uh, it's a very competitive race, uh, but uh, Joe Biden seems to have the edge. And Donald Trump has said that he may not accept the result if it does not go his way. Uh, do, do you think this will trigger a legal challenge? Well, that's, it's raised a lot of concerns, obviously, when the president said that uh, uh, he would uh, question the, the results of the election. Uh, of course, that would only happen if he lost, uh, that he would uh, question whether or not the election uh, was run fairly. I think, I think it's been made clear, both by Republicans and Democrats, that if it is a, a free and fair election, which we've always had in this country, uh, and it's clear who the winner is, uh, that uh, uh, everyone would support our Constitution uh, and uh, would uh, require that there be a peaceful uh, transition of power from one president to the other. So even though the president uh, has said uh, what he said, uh, I think the leadership in this country plus the military leadership in our country will all support the Constitution. You think it'll come to that? For the military leadership to have to intervene? Well, it, uh, you know, it, it is hard to say. I hope it doesn't, uh, because uh, our democracy has always been able to conduct uh, elections, some, sometimes during the most difficult periods, uh, during the Civil War, during World Wars. We have always been able to have free and fair elections in the United States. Uh, the biggest problem right now are the comments being made by the president. Uh, which are raising questions. Uh, I think if there is a, a, a big vote, and I think there will be a big vote uh, this election, and if that vote is clear as to who the winner is, uh, then regardless of what Mr. Trump says, I think that uh, this country will support the results of the election and require that a transition be made. So I, I'm pretty confident that uh, that our democracy is going to uh, continue to function uh, despite uh, what the president may or may not say. Right, we could all do with some optimism in these days. Uh, let's talk about Donald Trump's record as president and his foreign policy in particular. He's had a few hits and very many misses. Uh, but under Trump, it is said that America dehyphenated between India and Pakistan. Do you, would you say that that's something that President Obama failed to do? And why is that? Well, I think there is, uh, there's no question that uh, we do have good relations with uh, India. Uh, Pakistan still remains pretty tenuous uh, in terms of the relationship. Uh, but the biggest problem, I think, with regards to President Trump uh, is the idea that the United States would gradually withdraw from its leadership role in the world to an America first policy, essentially an isolationist policy. And that's not what the United States is all about. We have, we have exercised world leadership. We have exercised strong ties with our allies, whether it's India, whether it's uh, other countries uh, in Asia, whether it's NATO uh, in Europe. Those have always been strong alliances that have protected our national security. The president, unfortunately, uh, has weakened uh, those alliances and raised questions about whether or not they can trust the United States. To the specific question of dehyphenation, this president has not felt the need to visit Pakistan while he was visiting India, and that's uh, that's progress uh, from where, uh, from from Delhi's point of view, at least. Yeah, no, I think I think that's true. I think uh, we we still have a great deal of concern about uh, 
about Pakistan uh, and uh, whether or not it uh, continues uh, to uh, support uh, instability in uh, Afghanistan as well as uh, in India. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, I think there, there are continuing concerns about uh, what will happen uh, with Pakistan. And I think this president has reflected those concerns, just like President Obama reflected those same concerns about Pakistan's role. Would you say President Donald Trump took a firmer and clearer stand on, 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 on what his priorities were and uh, who he thought was a sponsor of terror versus a country that was fighting terrorism coming from outside vis-a-vis -vis President Obama, who tried to always balance the two? Uh, not really, since uh, I, when I was uh, director of the CIA, we conducted uh, an operation to go after bin Laden uh, in Pakistan. Uh, that was a, a very difficult mission, and the president made a very tough decision to do that. And as uh, director of the CIA, uh, my primary role was to uh, target terrorism, whether it was uh, in Afghanistan or Pakistan or in the Middle East. And I had strong support from the president to do that. Uh, at the same time, I think President uh, Trump has been tough with regards to terrorism as well, uh, with regards to ISIS and going after terrorist leaders. Uh, he's been willing to do that. So I think, uh, I think the United States generally has made it very clear that we will not tolerate terrorism that uh, can be a potential risk to our country or to other countries. After all this, these years, uh, will you say it out, out loud in so many words that the Pakistan government of the day was aware and was in fact harboring Osama bin Laden? <laughs> uh, it was, uh, you know, when we, when we discovered uh, the location of this uh, compound uh, in Pakistan, uh, it was located in a place called Abbottabad. Uh, Abbottabad uh, is uh, a center for their intelligence services, and it also uh, has a, the uh, Pakistani West Point is located there as well. This compound was three times the size of other compounds had 18 foot walls on one side and 12 foot walls on the other side with barbed wire around it. Uh, I find it very difficult to believe that there wasn't somebody in Pakistan who was aware of this compound. Was the Pakistani establishment then confronted with what you found? Uh, well, we had to, once we found the compound, we had to make a decision whether we would share that information uh, with Pakistan. Uh, and the president made the decision that because when we shared information with Pakistan about the location of terrorists, uh, they were tipped off uh, and warned uh, and suddenly were able to disappear. Because of that concern uh, and that lack of trust, very frankly, we decided not to inform the Pakistanis about the location uh, of bin Laden uh, and we did not inform them about the operation that we conducted because uh, we were concerned that if we did, that uh, it was likely bin Laden would be advised uh, to move. So because of what we did, I think we were able to be successful in the mission to go after bin Laden. To me, that sounds like a serious trust deficit with someone uh or, or a government that America has throughout called an ally in the war on terror. Having said that, did the government of the U.S. inform any other country, and was India on the list, and what was the reaction from New Delhi? Well, we, uh, we had made a decision that uh, uh, if we were able to get bin Laden, uh, that uh, rather than uh, having him uh, buried uh, in, in Pakistan or elsewhere where it could become a shrine, uh, that we would bury him at sea. Uh, and to do that, we did it in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and uh, we advised uh, countries of the fact that we would bury him in the Indian, Indian Ocean. Uh, and India, as always, was uh, very supportive. Uh, and uh, I think for, for my purposes, both as as director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense, uh, I found India to be a very close ally 
uh, in the effort to try to protect the security of both India and the United States. Do you fear that Pakistan still harbors terrorists who pose a, a threat to the security of both the U.S. and India? I don't, I don't think there's any question that uh, Pakistan continues to have relationship with uh, uh, various terrorist uh, groups in Pakistan. Uh, we were very concerned, obviously, uh, when uh, you know, we, were, we were fighting a great deal in Afghanistan, uh, that there were terrorists who were coming across the border of Pakistan in order to attack our forces. Uh, and we continued uh, to complain to Pakistan that they had to take steps to prevent that from happening. Uh, they never really did. Uh, and they also, I think, used terrorism uh, as a vehicle to undermine stability, not just uh, obviously in Afghanistan, but also in India. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the United States expressed uh, a lot of concerns that Pac Pakistan had to do more to deal with terrorism uh, in their country. And I think the world also needs to do more to eliminate Pakistan's terror networks. How does it help, Mr. Panetta, uh, when the U.S. government, after knowing everything that you've just told us, gets Pakistan on board uh, when it tries to negotiate peace in Afghanistan? Well, that's a challenge. Uh, and it, it always has been. Uh, I think... Uh, you know, we've continued to try to work uh, with Pakistan. When I was CIA director, I tried to work with their intelligence services. When I was Secretary of Defense, uh, I tried to work with their defense ministry. Uh, but, you know, while, while there were those that did provide uh, cooperation, uh, the fact was there were many that maintained ties uh, to terrorist networks. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to kind of trust Pakistan uh, to be supportive of efforts to achieve peace in Afghanistan or in that region. Does India have any role in the Afghanistan peace process, according to you, and what role do you see for India, apart from what the, 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 the developmental aid and all the work that the government is doing, what role do you see for New Delhi in the peace process per se? Well, you know, it's important that... Uh, countries in that region support this process. Uh, and India has been supportive of the peace process. Uh, and we've always found that uh, India has been a very good partner to the United States uh, in dealing with issues in that region. I think the most important thing we need right now uh, is to try to see that these uh, negotiations can proceed. But more importantly, that uh, the terrorists that are negotiating, uh, the Taliban, uh, understand that they have to be part of a democratic process in Afghanistan, uh, that they have to allow uh, human rights, that they have to allow people uh, the opportunity to self-govern, uh, and that the United States is not going to simply walk away from that situation. Uh, and allow uh, the Taliban or other terrorists to take over in Afghanistan. And I think that is of concern to India. Right now, I think uh, we feel that we have the support of countries in that region to make clear that uh, terrorism has to stop in Afghanistan. You've always advocated deeper defense ties between India and the U.S., but there was a time when New Delhi was... Uh for want of a better word, reluctant to be seen as a military ally of America. Things have changed now. The two countries call each other strategic allies and they're meeting uh, in a matter of days. Uh, the Quad meeting is going to happen uh, and, and this is being seen as an alliance to counter China. What role do you see in this new strategic uh, equation that is back in focus, the Quad? I think it's extremely important. Look, I, I think uh, if the United States is going to, uh, I, I believe it should continue to provide leadership in the world, working with our allies. There are a number of areas where we need our allies, uh, whether it's in the Middle East and dealing with uh, Iran, uh, whether it's in Asia, dealing with North Korea, whether it's in Europe, uh, dealing with Russia, uh, and whether it's with India, 
uh, and the countries there and dealing with China. Uh, I think it's critical that countries that believe in democratic principles, that believe in the values of freedom and liberty and the ability to self-govern and the dignity of the individual, that those countries should work together uh, when it comes to security. Uh, and I, I am concerned uh, that there have been events uh, on the China-India border uh, that uh, have occurred recently that always raise the specter of potential conflict. Uh, and I think we have to make very clear to China uh, that the United States will stand with India uh, if there is any conflict in that region. How far do you think the United States is prepared to go in the event of a conflict with China? I, I think that uh, the United States uh, owes it to our, our allies uh, to, be able, to be able to support them uh, in any potential conflict. Now, how far we go, how, um, you know, whether we directly involve ourselves, I think uh, that's going to be a question uh, depending on just uh, what are the actions of China uh, and what are their intentions. Uh, so far, I, I believe China understands that a war is not in their interest. It's not in their economic interest. It's not in their country's interest. Uh, but as we know, when there are tensions uh, and mistakes are made, conflicts can erupt. So I think the United States will determine whether or not uh, this is an aggressive action by China, or whether this is uh, an error of some sort by people along the border area. Uh, to determine just exactly what role it will play in, in that type of conflict. Do you think the United States and, and other global institutions and leaders are doing enough to hold China accountable for what uh, the world has suffered this year? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, no, I don't. I think that, uh, you know, we are essentially in a Cold War uh, with China. Uh, and I... I think that China has uh, taken steps to try to take advantage of uh, opportunities because uh, they view the United States as uh, pulling back from responsibilities in the world, whether it's with trade uh, or in other areas. Uh, and they've taken advantage of that. Uh, and uh, they also continue, frankly, uh, their military aggressiveness in developing uh, and militarizing really the islands in the South China Sea, uh, in the approach they've taken to Hong Kong, in the approach they're taking uh, towards Taiwan. Uh, they have been uh, particularly uh, aggressive. And uh, we also have had obviously a difficult relationship with regards to trade. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, obviously we express a tremendous amount of concern with China with regards to uh, the failure really to alert the world uh, to COVID-19 and the dangers that all of us are now experiencing as a result of that. Look, I, I think it's important to have a dialogue with China. Uh, I think it's important to continue to communicate uh, with China's leaders, but I think we have to do it from a position of strength. Uh, I would say that uh, to India, I would say that to others that deal with China. Uh, the only way you can deal with China is from a position of strength. That means maintaining our military strength and making very clear that there are lines that China should not cross. Do you think India is doing that? Uh, I think the United States is, uh, is making those points clear. Uh, I think India is making those points clear. Uh, and I think to that extent, uh, you know, my sense is that China will think twice about uh, any aggression in that part of the world. How do you see the Modi government's policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. and how he's developed a, a closer relationship, would you say, with Washington in, in, in the last few years that he's been at the helm? I, th I think that has been a good thing for India and a good thing for the United States. Uh, I, I think uh, India represents uh, one of the uh, strong and growing economies and powers in that part of the world. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they represent, you know, I believe, a democracy. Uh, and that's important as well. They represent a strong economy. Uh, we rely a great deal uh, on India to uh, 
provide support for our high tech industry in this country. So I, I, think, uh, I think having a close relationship uh, not only is important from a security point of view, I think it's also very important from an economic point of view. Do you see the Biden administration having a similar relationship with India as the Trump administration has had? We've seen the Howdy, Howdy Modi event and we've seen uh, the very obvious bonhomie between the two leaders. And I understand that uh, relations between two countries are not uh, only about individuals, they're about national interest. But Joe Biden's comments on Kashmir have not been very welcome. Well, Joe Biden is probably the most qualified person to run for president of the United States. Uh, he's had 50 years of uh, experience. Uh, he, he was involved with the uh, Foreign Relations Committee and the Senate side. Uh, he's traveled throughout the world. He knows all of the world leaders uh, as a result of that. Uh, as vice president, uh, he was kind of the point of the spear uh, for that administration in dealing with countries abroad. So he knows the leaders, he knows the issues, he knows the, the, the questions that uh, have to be addressed. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, my personal view is that uh, Joe Biden will maintain a strong alliance with India and with, with other friends and allies that we have. As a matter of fact, I think he will do more to strengthen our alliances because he believes that is the key to dealing with conflict in the future. And my final question, you've seen so much uh, uh, in your time. You've, you've uh, helmed the CIA. You've been uh, uh, the Defense Secretary of the US. How do you think wars in the future will be fought? Uh, because we've seen bombs and missiles being dropped, and now we see a microbe practically bringing the world to a halt. Uh, do you think weapons will be redundant going forward? I think we have to prepare ourselves for uh, that kind of future. Uh, I mean, I, we have seen what's been called hybrid war conducted by Russia uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, the ability to use cyber, the ability to use uh, forces uh, with different uniforms, uh, the ability to use uh, social media, the ability to be able to undermine uh, through social media, stability. They're doing that in the United States as we speak uh, in our elections, trying to undermine uh, our elections. Uh, I think the wars of the future are going to involve uh, the kind of high technology that uh, will mean that uh, instability can be produced uh, not by forces on the ground, not by uh, fighter planes or bombers in the air, Instability can be produced from a computer uh, deploying viruses that can uh, paralyze countries, bring down their electric grid system, bring down their financial systems, uh, bring down uh, their government systems. Uh, that's a reality. So I think it's very incumbent on countries like India and the United States and our other allies to be better prepared to deal with a very different kind of war in the future. Mr. Leon Panetta, thanks very much. It was a very engaging conversation, sir. Nice to talk to you.